This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews or news, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance too with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Worried about letting someone else pick out the perfect avocado for your perfect impress them on the third date guacamole? Well, good thing Instacart shoppers are as picky as you are. They find ripe avocados like it's their guac on the line. They are milk expiration date detectives. They bag eggs like the 12 precious pieces of cargo they are. So let Instacart shoppers overthink your groceries so that you can overthink what you'll wear on that third date. Download the Instacart app to get free delivery on your first three orders while supplies last. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. We took it all. We brought them to our land. An endless night. Ember hot and icy cold. The rage of the earth. We made this curse. Carved it in the blood on our backs. We did not see. We could not, but she did. And in the end, what will I become? Senwa Saga, Hellblade 2. Play it now with Game Pass. It's time. It's time. Time to get in the zone. Time to get in the zone. With the 49ers Web Zone. This is the No Huddle Podcast with Al and Brian. Forty ers Web Zone No Huddle Podcast, part of the Odyssey Network. I'm El Sacco with you, and I am pumped to talk draft, and I'm pumped to talk draft with our guest today. He is ESPN NFL Draft Analyst and Insider, Matt Miller, and he's also a 49ers fan. Matt, it's good to have you here, buddy. I appreciate you, man. And yes, uh, to clear up all the confusion, I live around Kansas City, and my whole family are Chiefs fans. So people are like, oh, this guy's a Chiefs fan. I, you can't see it on the shelf behind me. It's like full of Niners stuff. I've been a Niners fan since I was six years old. So that's great. Uh, happy to be on with you guys today. And, and you know, this is something that's like close to my interest as well, not just as a draft analyst, but as a Niners fan. Did you grow up in Casey? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's funny because like I have two older brothers and neither of them are Chiefs fans either. Like, um, so I didn't adopt like being a fan from my parents at all. My, my, my parents don't really care about sports. And so I was allowed to just pick my own teams. And so I grew up a Niners fan because they were on, like they were what was on TV. So um, it's been, it's been fun. You know, like the first 15 years of my life, they never had a losing season. It was amazing. I got spoiled. Yeah. And, and so it's been, you know, I just got hooked on, you know, I was at the tail end of Montana, but like Jerry Rice and Steve Young and um, you know, so many great players during that time period that I was, I was just hooked. Yeah, it's the same for me. We're probably pretty close in age. So I, so I have a Yankees hat on right now. I'm, I'm a New Yorker and I grew up in New York and my dad's a Colts fan and my mom's a Bills fan. But I just grew up watching the Niners and I fell in love towards the tail end of Montana and Rice and, and that was it. And it's just it's ever since then I'm obsessed. So <laughs> we're in the same boat, Epic Man, in terms of that. But so I want I want to ask you, you know, when I when I look at the draft and I look at the Niners, so this team appears like they're still going to be good in 2024, right? They still have a lot, of very talented roster. Yeah. But when you look at it sort of moving forward, guys are aging. There's contracts that are coming to an end. So I feel like when you think of 2025, beyond, you know, 2024 and beyond and 2025, there's a lot of different ways they can go here. But I think O-line is where a lot of people sort of have their blinders on with. So I'm, I want to start there. Do you think that's a huge need and can you see them addressing it very early in the draft? I, so I do think it's a huge need. And I will say like, I've been banging that drum since like October, you know? So it wasn't just like a postseason overreaction. It was when I really started diving in on team needs, uh, you know, probably around October and looking at like, okay, Trent Williams is a hall of famer. He's getting mm-hmm. older. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to cry the day he retires because he's such a huge part of this team. Aaron Banks has been, Okay, he's a free agent after this year. Uh, and then on the right side of the line, you know, you have guys who are there. You know, if you had one of these dudes as a starter, you'd be like, okay, we we have a good offensive line around them. I'm not worried about it. But I think when you look at the totality of the line from center to right tackle, you don't have anyone, you know, kind of lifting that group up. You know, I, you can mm-hmm. look at so many teams like 
Kansas City uh, two years ago during their Super Bowl run when they beat the Eagles, it was like that. If like you've got really solid guys at you know three or four spots, it's okay to have a right tackle who's struggling. You know, this year Kansas City at times good starters at four spots. It's okay if your left tackle is struggling at times or if your right tackle is struggling at times. You can kind of lift each other up because of on the offensive line, the unit matters as much as the individual. But when I look at this group, it's like the scheme covers up things. You know, Purdy covers mm-hmm. up some things. But, gosh, like having that, you know, more of an impact player along the offensive line I think would be huge for this team. So, yeah, when I when I did my final team needs, I think they, they might actually be out now. I'm not entirely sure. Um, it was like, you know, right tackle, guard, center. Mm-hmm. You know, like those are the, the spots that I would start with for San Francisco. And you look at sort of the way the Saints built around Drew Brees, who was a smaller quarterback. The interior O line is is so important. Yeah, Kyle Shanahan. I feel like you know there was Alex Mack, and I feel like they spent money on Weston Richburg. Do you do you think a center early on, not in the first round, but maybe third, fourth round, they, they would they would because Brendel's thirty three, so they have to have you know a succession plan there. Do you, do you see a center? Are there any centers that you like around that range? And I'll tell you, I would probably draft Zach Frazier from West Virginia in the first round, depending on what the board okay. looks like, right? Like, but. I love Zach Frazier, and I think he is tailor-made for, for a, a zone scheme. You know, his movement ability, his strength. He was a four-time state wrestling champ in high school. Like, he's just tough as hell, really athletic. And so would he be a, a first-round player for every team? Probably not. But I think for San Francisco, I would consider him just because I think he's plug-and-play and he's going to give you that that toughness and the, the agility on the inside. The center class is actually really strong this year, though. It's like – even if you don't go Zach Frazier at 32, like Tanner Bordellini from Wisconsin in the third round or Mason McCormick from South Dakota State in the third round, Bo Limmer from Arkansas, probably right in that range too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those there are guys that would be really good starters in his own scheme right out of the gate. So I would, I would strongly advocate for a, a center. And I think, you know, we can look across the league at some of the great offenses. You know, again, Kansas City with Creed Humphrey, Baltimore with Tyler Linderbaum. Like sure. so many teams have invested in the pivot point up front. Uh, the Eagles with Jason Kelsey for forever. You know, so I, I think left tackle and center, uh, to me, the two most important positions up front. So I, I do think it's a spot you invest. If they do decide to go tackle late in the first round, there's guys like Morgan, Guy in Suma Atiyah, um, Umagagi, I'm probably going to mess his name up, but are there any of those guys that you like specifically for the Niners, those tackles, or is there, is there another late round tackle you prefer? I wanted uh, to leave Fuaga from Oregon State so bad. And I was actually, I would tweet and tag John Lynch in it. And then he got too good. <laughs> He's not going to be there at 31. So they won too many games or he got too good. So um, I think Jordan Morgan from Arizona would be interesting. And just because of the zone scheme, mm-hmm. He's, he would be another guy you have to draft at 31 as opposed to waiting. Um, the weird thing that I feel at tackle this year is there is a drop off. Like you've got the like 11 guys basically who are, are likely going to be top 40 picks. And after that, you know, the, there's just a lot of like, oh, this guy looks like a really good backup or, okay, like he could be a good, like Christian Jones from Texas will be a good right tackle, but hmm. he doesn't really fit the Niners scheme necessarily. And so um, Roger Rosengarten from Washington, you know, would be a good player for the scheme. I know, I know my my buddy Mel Kuyper had him in the first round of the Niners a while back. I think he's more of like a third round player. So you you have a drop off, you know, to some degree after those. We're going to see so many in the first round. So it's like if one's there at thirty one, you almost would move on that position just because there's not the depth. And I think mm-hmm. that's really important when teams build out their board. Like we talked about center. Like okay, we know there's going to be some starting centers in the third or fourth round. So if there's a tackle there that you like, yeah, take take Tyler Guyton, take a right tackle at 31 and then, you know, come back to center after you maybe address corner or wide receiver in, in round two or round three. And as they move forward and continue to build around Purdy, wide receiver looks great in 2024, assuming Ayuk's going to be there. You have Ayuk, yeah. you have Debo, you have Juwan Jennings. But then after that, kind of like, well, you hope you sign Ayuk long-term. Is Dino is Debo coming to the end of the line? Jennings has just signed for this year. I think wide receiver is a huge need moving yes. forward. And, and, and I, I feel like they're going to probably take one sooner than people think. What guys do you think would be a good fit for this team? Second, third round, if, if they don't go first. Yeah, it's tough because it's like, what is what are they looking for? You know, um, when they drafted Danny Gray in the third round, that was it. I'm not going to lie. That was like my jaw hit the floor. I couldn't believe they, you know, drafted mm-hmm. him that early. But it was like, okay, maybe they're looking for like a speed guy because that's not really, 
it's not Debo's game. And, you know, Ayuk's kind of a thicker guy, um, although a really good vertical player. So it's like looking at wide receiver, it's okay, what what is the player type that they're looking for? Because we can look at guys like, you know, Xavier Worthy is that stretch the field, you know, record setting speed mm-hmm. that could play here. Xavier Leggett is your Debo Samuel, you know, 6'1, 220, right. 4 3 speed, like he's a bully. Uh, same with Malachi Corley. They fit that mold really, really well. Uh, but it's, it's like, what, what do you, if you're trying to replace Ayuk, I'm going to lean more toward, you know, a, a Xavier Worthy or, you know, a Ricky Pearsall or Troy Franklin. Um, if you're starting to think about, okay, well, maybe we have, you know, Debo gets, gets beat up a little bit. We want the, a player that can be kind of like Juwan Jennings, you know, almost like a second Debo. Then I think that changes what you're looking for, but you know, it's, it's a stacked receiver class. I think we could see like 16 go in the top two rounds, which is insane that we could see that many go but i'm with you like i think if they can go o-line around one receiver potentially in round two and then you know i think at some point you gotta look at corner at some point you gotta look at the interior offensive line you got those three picks in the fourth that are gonna be really valuable but you know even a receiver at 31 i wouldn't completely like turn my nose at that just because we don't know we don't know with iu you know and um I feel like we it's such a similar playbook, you know, as to what Debo did and Debo got paid. So, you know, we'll see what happens there. But if the value is there at 31, I think you have to you have to go with the receiver. We took it all. We brought them to our land. An endless night, ember hot and icy cold. The rage of the earth. We made this curse. Carved it in the blood on our backs. We did not see. We could not, but she did. And in the end, what will I become? Senwa Saga, Hellblade Two. Play it now with Game Pass. Where are you on paying Ayuk? Because the wide receiver value is just exploding, and like you said, this class is loaded. Would you give him number one money, or, or would you kind of go a different way with that? Man, it's tough. Yeah, I so like I have to separate like the fan part of my brain who like doesn't want to <laughs> yes. see him leave from the team building part of my you know like analytical part. I I wouldn't pay him. I wouldn't. Now I will say this: I would have paid Ayuk before I paid Debo, and I understand like at the time that would have been a hot take. But as much as I love Debo, he's been banged up since college. Like it's just his yeah. play style. He he takes a lot of punishment. So at the time, I thought Ayuk was a better long term play just because of play style. So. Um, but they made their choice and Debo is a great player. I love Debo. I would hate to see him on any other team, but it's just, it feels like an impossibility given where wide receiver salaries are to pay two of them. And, you know, if you had a year one rookie quarterback, you could afford to do it and make it work. I think it gets a little bit harder now that Brock has some years under his belt and you're going to have to pay him and you're trying to forecast that out of, you have already in Nick Bosa, the the non-quarterback with the highest AAV like $33 million a year. Trent Williams is a high paid player. Christian McCaffrey is a mm-hmm. high paid player. It's like something's got to give. And, you know, I think wide receiver is one of those positions where you can get immediate impact from a rookie. You can get, you know, there's guys first round, second round, third round who come in and are great players. Hell, Puka Nuku was a fifth round pick and was a great player. Mm-hmm. So I think that's where it would, it would suck to see Brandon Oak playing for another team. But you have to understand that's how teams are built in this day and age. You know, you you get a young quarterback and you support them. And when that young quarterback yep. elevates, it's his turn to to support the players around him. And that's where San Francisco's at in that in that timeline right now. You mentioned corner too, and this is a position where I've been like screaming from the rooftops, like, what are what are we doing? Because you have Lenore, who's going to be a free agent. You have Ward, who's going to be a free agent. You have Hufunga, who's going to be a free agent. And you need another corner this year anyway, whether you're going to kick Lenore inside or you just want somebody else to the outside. They they need things there. But I wonder if they value that position enough where they would maybe take a Kool-Aid McKinstry in the first round. Can you see something like that happening? Or is it going to be a later round pick, like where they got Lenore and Hufunga in the fifth round type thing? I feel like that, like if so, if they take a corner at 31, I'm not going to be upset. Uh, but it doesn't feel like that's how they want to build this team. You know, it's it's almost like the same with the offensive line of like we're going to have one really good player, and then we're going to fill in the gaps with you know late round picks and and guys who are kind of journeyman type players. Uh, I would kick Lenore inside. I think he's great on the inside, and I would be trying mm-hmm. to find that other outside corner. You know, Ambry Thomas um, has not been the player that he needed to be. Basically, if you're drafted in the third round by John Lynch, you're not going to be good is, is what we're discovering here with <laughs> Danny Gray and, 
Amber Thomas, like, God, I would yeah, unless you're Fred Warner, that. I guess. Yeah. yeah, Fred Warner would be the huge exception. Uh, yeah, to that, to that argument uh, for sure. But I, I would, I would say, yeah, you know, getting that outside corner, whether it be first round, you know, like the Kool Aid or Ennis Rakestraw, I think would be a really good scheme fit here. Um, mm-hmm. Someone like that in the in the first round, I would be really happy about. Outside of that, it, it does feel like this is a team that would look at guys in like the fourth round, you know, and look at like a. Maybe it's yeah. a player like Jarvis Brownlee from Louisville, who's like a you know, really good inside player, super physical at the line of scrimmage, and you you bump Lenore outside, or you take Kyrie Jackson from Oregon, who's got some injury stuff, and but he's six foot four, and he you know he fits that kind of old school Niners mold of these you know, really big corners. Um, so there's 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 such good value at corner. I I hope they add. They said they have three picks in round four. I hope they add a corner somewhere in the you know top hundred and fifty picks of this draft, but. Um, it's it's a huge need. I just don't know that they'll pull the trigger on it early. So before we let you go, man, I got to ask you sort of an overarching NFL question, because I think the league needs an influx of new QB talent pretty badly. And after 2021, like I'm never getting fooled again with a QB draft class. <laughs> I just you tell myself, Al, you know nothing with how bad that draft class was. But this class yep. looks anyway like there's some serious quarterbacks coming in. Caleb Williams, May, maybe, you know, maybe McCarthy, Daniels. We'll see. Do you think this is a legit class? We know some of these guys are going to be busts just because history tells yeah. us that. But where are you on this QB class? Do you think this is the next really solid class that's going to help maybe take the NFL into the next generation? I don't know that I would go that far. Um, I, I think it's a little more like last year where there's some really intriguing players with a lot of upside. You know, like Caleb is great. I think he's going to be really good wherever he goes. I think Jaden mm-hmm. Daniels has a lot of potential to be great. After that, I like I fall into situations where like Drake May in the right situation could be really good. Drake May mm-hmm. in the wrong situation could be really bad. Same with JJ McCarthy. So it's like it's easy to see six quarterbacks come out of this draft to be starters. It's easy to see two quarterbacks come out of this draft to be starters. You know, you mentioned 2021, 2022 were terrible quarterback drafts. Out, you know, Trevor Lawrence with Jacksonville is the only one you would say in that time span. Like, yep, there was a hit. They they got that one right. So um, everything looks great in early April, but the reality is these teams are going to mess up. You know, they're going to, I've been saying it for months now, New England has terrible offensive infrastructure. They don't have a left tackle. They don't have a number one wide receiver. I would argue they don't have a number two wide receiver. Mm-hmm. You know, like they have, they have no infrastructure for this young quarterback who's going to be expected to be Tom Brady. And that I would, if I were New England, I would build the team first. You know, look at San Francisco. It's a great example of that. Yeah. You know, they thought they had the team built. They, they swing on Trey Lance and miss, but boom, they hit on Brock Purdy. And so I think there's a lesson to be learned there of, you know, San, Kansas City, they built the team and they had Alex Smith, who was good, but they knew the team was built. So they go get a Patrick Mahomes, the Bears, you know, they had Justin Fields from the former regime. Who knew if that was going to work out or not, but they built the team up and they, they had an insurance policy in case it didn't work. And now they're going to get Caleb Williams. So you know, I, I think for all these guys, like whoever goes to Minnesota, I feel like they're going to be set to have success. Whoever goes to, to New England, maybe not as much. And it's nice to be a Niners fan and not have to worry about quarterback at all for once. So we're actually yeah. <laughs> actually good there. So, yeah. All right, Matt, really, really appreciate the time. Um, you will have an open invitation here whenever you want to come back and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Niners on three. One, two, three. Niners! Sports is an Odyssey company.